very simply, again, it's a systems accounting and a systems approach to eventually production and distribution, which I'll cover next. So we have our earthly survey. We have a system to govern it, which is easily doable through technology today and sensor systems. By the way, modern corporations already have a great deal of this information. They simply hoard it because they don't want people to understand their corporate secrets, their proprietary. I can assure you that mining companies, for example, know the basic amount of diamonds or other materials they have at their disposal to a certain degree. So please don't pawn this off that it can't be done. Tracking earthly resources is being done. It's just not unified in any particular way. And it's certainly not complete because there isn't an intention to do so. There's no reason for people to do so outside of their own self-interest for the corporation. So OK, the next point production. This is also explicitly self-evident and does not fall victim to cultural relativism or human opinion as well. Production operates in a preservation model just like anything else because the very process of production is energy intensive and resource intensive. So naturally, again, preservation is key, except preservation and efficiency work on a few different levels when it comes to production. On the lowest level, there is the science behind what it means to produce and culminate any given good. There is also taking into account the negative retro actions of the process itself. If you have a process that does something very well, but it, pr it produces a great deal of pollution, uh, well, that's, that's something that has to be dealt with in a quantitative model to figure out how it balances out as far as the variables. Naturally, we want to limit pollution at all costs. Naturally, anything that's produced, we also want to have the greatest longevity. That is also utterly rational within the system. Naturally, we need to have an intellectual design attribute to anything that's made that can foreshadow irrelevancy or obsolescence that might occur within the culmination of the component technology where rather than having to throw the entire item away when it's obsolete, you actually update the item. This is very critical to design, sustainable design of future goods. Likewise, and this is another active dynamic variable of this economic model, just as the ones I just expressed, is that you have to take into account depletion rates of materials you're using. And in the event that it's discovered that a particular component mineral is in depletion, you would find substitutes. You would work to hybrid substitutes or to find other existing substitutes. And you would offset that possible decline before any type of problem emerges. I think everyone can see where I'm going here. There is a set of objective variables given our goal to be sustainable and as clean and as efficient as possible that makes all of the actions utterly self-evident. Another level of this, to throw in another attribute that's of a higher level beyond design and use of the resources themselves, is the location of the physical factories, the physical centers that create these goods. It would be utterly irrational to have the core component attributes on one continent and the production facilities on another continent, and then distribution demand on the other continent. You'd have to find the most linear balance between those three attributes to limit the amount of energy required to move any of that stuff around. Uh, this is just basic fundamental preservation theory, if you will, even though it's not a theory at all. It's absolutely self-evident. So I'm not going to go into a huge list of component attributes that would be taken into account from negative retroactions to design protocols to efficiency to recycling. That's another very important one. We want things to have built into it the ability to break down or the ability to be reused. So those attributes are built directly into the item and foreshadowed as such. So when the component is turned back in for recycling, whatever can be utilized again is done so as efficiently as possible to reduce the landfills that we see today, which do not have to exist whatsoever, et cetera. OK, that leads me to the next level, distribution itself. Production and distribution both relate, of course, to public demand. Demand is easy to assess through public consensus. And once demand is set in motion for any particular good, 
it is easily trackable within the system just as it's tracked today in any major department store. Uh, whenever inventory runs low, they're tracking it and they put in new orders for more inventory. So the exact same process is essentially at work here with no need for the tracking of money sequences or the use of money or the monetary system to track demand. Now, it's important to point out that the concept of value in a resource-based economy of any particular good can only relate to the possible scarcity of the resources that comprise that good coupled with the complexity of the production of that good. So their physical reference, not what you see in the monetary system today, where value is essentially invented based on a number of nonsensical attributes, uh, often vanity-oriented or falsely assumed uh, scarcity of uh, specific designs or what have you. Now, I want to also point out that in Jacques Fresco's work, once the efficiency mechanism is put into place, which governs in a resource-based economy, and the efficiency mechanism is throughout the entire thing, and I'll elaborate on this in the distribution model a little bit more in a second, the abundance created by the efficient use of resources, which would reduce the, uh, the, reduce the production consumption alone by a substantial percentage, uh, will be enough to create what we could call an abundance on this planet for all the world's people. Uh, when we say an abundance, sometimes people interpret that the wrong way. Obviously, the planet is finite. Obviously, there's only so much copper. Uh, you know, nanotechnology offers some amazing prospects, but this is about resource management under the assumption that we do have finite resources that are emaluable to a certain degree. And uh, again, back to Fresco's uh, awareness, uh, if we simply intelligently manage everything, all the world's people can benefit and live in an abundance, in a respective abundance. We're not talking about every individual having a gold-plated toilet and a 70,000-room mansion and 700 acres. Uh, you can extrapolate that a rational statement to just as equally as some movie stars that have two jet planes parked in their front lawn or someone who has 50 automobiles, and we say to ourselves, oh, that's freedom. No, that's, that's, that's uh, irresponsibility is what that is. So demand is assessed. Goods are produced. The efficiency mechanism works throughout. And keep that term in mind, too, the efficiency mechanism as an economic variable. That's a, a decent statement to refer to the general and overall approach to how every attribute of the economic system functions. When it comes to distribution, there are more or less three ways I think I could describe this from what I come to understand. You have delivery of the goods to yourself. This can be done very, very efficiently without the use of humans driving trucks and delivery services, the US Postal Service or UPS, through vacuum systems that uh, will send goods directly to your home. Uh, people say, well, that's just, that's too much. No, we have a sewage system in our home. We have infrastructure for that. There is absolutely no reason why delivery systems of goods cannot happen in the exact same manner. You simply design it right in. In fact, there was a great individual who referred to the sewer system as the intestines of the, uh, the city or the social system, which I thought was a great, uh, you know, a great metaphor to keep that kind of collective feel going with this sort of social organism. So when you design the cities, you design mechanisms of transport right in, either above ground or below ground, to eliminate the need for human delivery services. Uh, that's, that's a very basic logical thing. Everyone gets deliveries. Everyone sends out waste. Another attribute of the city system, and this is a little bit beyond the resource-based economy, economic model in specifics, but waste would also operate in the exact same fashion. You wouldn't have trucks pulling in and lifting up dumpsters. Waste would be built right into the system. Waste reduction, excuse me. In early... Uh, New York buildings, they had incinerators, and people would take their trash. It's actually a very unhealthy practice, and you would dump it down the chute. It would go into an incinerator. In the future, you'll have standardized packaging. 
In other words, every box will be made of a particular decomposable material that can probably be decomposed in your home. So you'll not only have a dishwasher in your home, you'll have a decomposition machine that can de decompose every form of packaging material that's used for transport right there. Boom, you've reduced an outrageous amount of packaging and plastic waste by having this type of organic compound created that could be decomposed in your home, which does exist. It's just not mass produced because of various uh, financial reasons. So building things into the system, a systems design, is, that's basically what I was extending there, uh, delivery, waste reduction. And when you have waste that can't be decomposed, it goes into another mechanism that sends it somewhere else. No one comes to your house to pick it up. Anyway, the city system design is a little bit different than a resource-based economy economic model, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna jump on that tangent. That's for another conversation. And Jock always does a great job of talking about that as well. Um, distribution, so that's one element of distribution, home distribution, or you could have distribution centers. Distribution centers can work a few different ways. Honestly, the most efficient way using our efficiency mechanism is to have what you consider as a rental type of arrangement. So obviously, if you want a television set, you go and acquire the television set, the demand is tracked, and you keep the television set or the screen or whatever the advanced technology might be. I strongly doubt physical television sets will continue to exist in the future. I think you'll end up with very, very malleable forms of screens or projection systems, but that's, again, for another conversation. But whatever that good might be, if it needs longevity, it's something that you choose to have for extended periods, then you have it for extended periods. If it breaks, you return it for recycling, which I'll go through in a moment. However, say you want to get something temporarily. Say you want to go out and shoot some video with a, a nice camera. Well, then you get the camera, you take it, you do what you need to with it, and then you return it. There's no sense storing something in your closet that you're never going to use again. Again, this is the efficiency mechanism. It's about creating a world where everything is utilized. Same with automobiles. Not everyone should have a car. It's insane in this American culture. It's the staple of capitalism. I remember seeing old propaganda videos of capitalism versus communism, and they say, well, in America, everyone has an automobile. They don't have that in communism. And uh, it was as though it was some value to get this thing that sits in your driveway for the majority of its life decaying. Uh, not to mention uh, the absolute pollution, both noise pollution, pollution, traffic pollution. If you've ever driven in New York and Los Angeles, well, if you don't want to blow your brains out just by being stuck in traffic, uh, uh, then you have the patience of a saint. Anyway, I won't go on that tangent. So this efficiency mechanism, again, can apply to every attribute of distribution. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is regional access. So say you want to go to a lake and you want to use a boat to go fishing or something to that effect. Well, you know, people do this today, in fact. They go and they rent a boat. Well, you do the same thing, except you don't have to pay money for it. You gain the boat, you utilize it, and you bring it back. Uh, this applies to other attributes, such as getting a tennis racket at a tennis club or anything you can think of, a violin. I would like everybody to go to their garages and their closets and look at things that they own that they rarely use and ask themselves, wouldn't it be great if I could just have access to the best version of this particular good when I needed it as opposed to having to store it? And again, what this does is reduce tremendously the multiplicity of goods that are created over and over and over again. The waste reduction itself of that practice will again bring a material abundance, an accessible material abundance to so many more people on this planet. Now, very quickly before I go 